Hey, good morning, First Christian Church. Hey, it is another good day for us to come together and worship our King. So would you, with me, enter into this time with prayer? Our God, who is merciful, compassionate, all-powerful, and just, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, we come now and worship you in all humility, recognizing that any good that is in us or part of our lives is something that you have accomplished and is your work. We're grateful to be a part of it. God, as we come before you now, increase our awareness of your presence, and may the sincerity of our hearts and our minds be pleasing in your sight. In your name we pray. Amen. Would you join with me now in worship through song? Christ the Lord is risen today. Alleluia. Sons of men and angels say, Alleluia. Raise your joys and triumphs high. Alleluia. Sing ye heavens and earth reply. Alleluia. our souls to save Alleluia Where's thy victory boasting great Alleluia Love's redeeming work is done Alleluia the fight, the battle's won. Alleluia. Death in vain forbids him rise. Alleluia. Christ hath opened paradise. Alleluia. has led Alleluia Following our exalted head Alleluia Made like Him Like Him we rise Alleluia Ours across the grave The skies Alleluia And Sing with me, praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. So my soul praise Him, for He is thy health and salvation. All ye who hear, now to His temple draw near. Praise Him in glad adoration. Praise to the Lord, who o'er all things so wondrously reigneth, shelters thee under his wings, yea, so gently sustaineth. Hast thou not seen how thy desires there have been, granted in what he ordaineth? Doth prosper thy work and defend thee. Surely his goodness and mercy here daily attend thee. Ponder anew what the Almighty can do if with his love he befriend thee. Praise to the Lord who hath 
justly made thee. Health hath vouchsafed, and when heedlessly falling hath stayed thee, what need or grief ever hath failed of relief? Wings of his mercy did shade thee. Praise to our God. Well, greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ as we come together to look into God's Word together. Uh, those of you who are a part of First Christian Church of Morristown, thank you for allowing me to share the Word with you. And anybody who may be visiting with us, uh, really hope that when we begin to meet together again, uh, you'll come see us here in the building. Probably you've received message that the plan right now uh, is that next Sunday on May the 10th, Mother's Day, uh, we will meet together. Uh, here at First Christian. Uh, let me make a few comments about that. Uh, please, if you are having some health issues or if you are especially concerned, uh, it's okay not to come. Please do not feel guilty about staying away. This is one of those very difficult times and, and we don't want anybody to come uh, being afraid. We don't want anybody to come uh, who may be endangering their health or somebody else's health. So don't, don't feel bad uh, if you decide that you need to stay home. Uh, we're still going to provide a sermon that you can be able to listen to uh, on the website. So uh, please, please think about that. Uh, secondly, I would encourage you to understand that the leadership, the elders and the staff, uh, are going to be working to set up some precautions, uh, some things to be sure that we are practicing safe things as much as we can, uh, which may mean you may not be able to sit in your favorite seat. It may mean service will be radically different than it normally is. So when you come, please be understanding of that. Uh, this is being done for your safety and the safety of anyone who attends. And I thank you so very much in advance for your consideration of that. I'm still looking forward for us to be together again. Well, why don't we pray together, please? Father, thank you so very much for your grace and love that draws us together in the body of Christ. Thank you for what you've done for us because of your love. And as we think about that today, I pray that you would lead by your Holy Spirit, that you would encourage and strengthen, that you would teach us and speak to us now. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I think there are some words that carry with them just a good feeling when you hear them. One of those words is the word together. And I've been hearing a lot of that here lately during this pandemic. And there's one phrase that I've picked up on a couple of times. I saw it written out. Even apart, we are in this together. I like that phrase. Even apart, we are in this together. And so there have been a lot of talk about what we're doing together. People who are together encouraging those who are on the front lines. People who are coming together to help feed the hungry. People who are looking forward to the day when they can be together with their family. And there maybe is a little bit of sadness there because I do miss being together. Because right now we're not together in this building. I'm preaching to a camera and empty pews. That's not what I'm used to. And I do miss us being together. But wait just a minute. What is said about the pandemic could be said very much so about those of us who are part of the church. Even apart, we are in this together. So what I want to do during the month of May is deal with the subject of being together. That's the title of the, of the series, just simply together. And I want to talk about what it means to be a part of the church and what the church does because we are in this together. And today, this is foundational to understand why we are together. And I want to talk to you about being together in and by His love. There's another good word, isn't it? The word love. It's a word that's used a lot. It's thrown around a lot. People sing songs about love. People talk about loving each other and loving things. And, but I think a lot of people really don't stop to understand and think about what love really means. Love, in a biblical sense, is seeking the other person's highest good. It's wanting what's best for them. It may even mean sacrificial giving of self for the benefit of others. Love, love is a decision. Love is a command that we have to respond to. 
Love is action. Bob Goss has written a book that says love does. So church, even apart, we are together, and we are together by and in his love. Now the text for this message comes from Jesus' words toward the end of his ministry in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. Jesus said, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. And then over in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 9 through 14, Jesus says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in His love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. Now, there are four facts here that I want to give you to help us understand what it means that we are together in and by His love. Number one, Jesus' love is why we are together. Jesus' love is why we are together. What what makes us a church? Uh, What brings about unity? What causes us to talk about being a part of this First Christian Church family? What what does it? it? Is it just being in the same building together? Is, is that all there is to it? I've been in Nayland Stadium a few times. I've been several years, but I've been there for a football game, over 100,000 people. Uh, even though most of those people were rooting for the same team, I don't consider that I was united with them. I was just in a football game. Just being in the same building doesn't make people united. What is it that draws people into the church? What is it that makes the message of the gospel attractive? It's the message of love. Why is it that John 3.16 was for many, many years the most popular verse in the Bible? For God so loved the world. Jesus said he came to seek and to save the lost. And and he told stories about things that were lost that had been found. and, And we love those stories because they picture what Jesus did for us because he loves us. And we begin to understand that what makes this message of the gospel so attractive is the love that Jesus has. John chapter 15, again, verses 9 and 10, Jesus said, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in His love. When people begin to hear the message of the love of God begins to impact them. When when we heard the message of the fact that no matter what we had done, no matter how bad we had been, that God still loved us and that God was drawing us to himself as we heard that, it made that message attractive. And that's how we became a part of the church. Think Think about the good news of the gospel. Christ died for our sins. And 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 when you begin to look at the message of the cross, that's that's really, it's, it's pretty brutal. Jesus died an awful death. The crucifixion is a, is a terrible thing. But, but as we see that, we begin to understand that even that brutal, ugly death was a sign of God's love. And that's what draws people. In John chapter 12, Jesus said, verse 32, But I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. Verse 33, he said this to show what kind of death he was going to die. And so what draws people is this message of the love of God. And it is because of the love of God that when then we are able to become a part of the family, a part of the church, a part of those people who are God's people. Here's how Paul says it, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. 
And so as we think about being together, let's understand we're together not just because we meet in the same place, not just because we have the same interest, but we're together because we've been drawn by the love of God and the work of Jesus Christ. Being saved people, we've become a family together. Back uh, a while ago, a year ago or so, before we moved from Illinois to uh, Tennessee, I had come down to, to Knoxville for a meeting. And uh, while I was there, my son and daughter-in-law and two grandsons, they were having a birthday party at the house, at their house, and so I got to go. Well, there were some of the cousins there that don't know me because they're from my daughter-in-law's side of the family, don't know me well. And uh, one of them was five-year-old, and I walked into a room, and he looked at me, and he said, who are you, and why are you here? It's not a bad question. Who are you, and why are you here? And if we can begin to understand that who we are, if we're Christians, we are children of God. He has given us that right because of his love to be his children. And why we're here is because of his love and the work of Jesus on the cross. And when we understand that, it makes a difference in understanding that we are, even though apart, we're still united. We're still together in this. So don't forget, our being together is not just what happens on Sunday. Our being together is not just being in the same building. Our being together is not just what happens at First Christian Church of Morristown. It's part of being in God's family, united with Christians everywhere who follow Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And that happened because of his great love for us. We were brought together by his love. But there's a second fact that I want you to see. And that is our response to Jesus' love is to love others. Our response to Jesus' love, this love we've received, is to love others. John chapter 13, again, verse 34, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Not only are we together by his love, we are together in his love. Now in the world, people decide whom they're going to love based on Common interest, attractiveness, friendliness, what can you do for me? But in God's family, that's not the standard. In God's family, we love because we've been loved. In God's family, we are patient with others because we've received God's patience. We're merciful to others because we've received God's mercy. We're kind to others because God has been kind to us. We forgive because we have been forgiven. And all of a sudden we begin to understand this concept of being in this body of Christ because of the love of God causes us to love one another. Now you know that John wrote uh, three letters other than his gospel. And in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12, here's what the apostle says. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. To love people, not because of them, but because of what we have received. Let me share this with you. Brian Wilkerson, in a sermon called Deep Love, says this, a pastor from Oxford named Vaughn Roberts put it this way, when you love people who are like you, that's ordinary. When you love people who are unlike you, that's extraordinary. But when you love people who dislike you, that's revolutionary. And that's the kind of love that John is calling us to. The kind of love the world is waiting to see. Remember, 
It's a command. It's not a matter of how we feel. It's not a matter of how other people act. It's a matter of the fact that since we have received from God love and kindness and patience and mercy and forgiveness, as his people, our responsibility is to return that to other people. So we decide whether we're going to obey the command regardless of how other people may act. Now, to be very honest, that's not easy. And so I understand it's not only what we decide to do, it's what God is producing in us. Because you may remember that Paul says in the book of Galatians that there are these things that he calls the fruit of the Spirit. That is what the Holy Spirit produces in us. And the first thing in that list is the fruit of the Spirit is love. And we understand that because we've been loved, then we love. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 19 through 21, John says we love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he's a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And he's given this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. And so, in a world where there are so many differences, in a world where, quite honestly, some people are not very lovable or likable, uh, in a world where there are those who may hate us, how do we respond as people who at one time were enemies of God but yet have received His mercy, as people who at one time were away from God but yet have been drawn near by His love? How do we respond to other people? We respond in love because we are who we are by His love and now we are to live in His love and that love for other people. Well, how do we learn to do it? We learn to do it by spending time with Jesus. The more time we spend with Jesus, the more time we are with Him, the more we learn what it means to be like Him. And the more we are like Him, then the more we're going to learn how to treat others with kindness, with love, and with respect. And the more we spend time with Him, the more we practice obeying the commands, the better we will be at this matter of loving one another. But I want to take it a third step. Let me give you a third fact. Jesus' love is how we are to love others. Now, let's be practical here. Jesus' love is how we are to love others. Did you notice what Jesus said? John 13, verse 34. A new command I give you, love one another. We already talked about that. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Now, you may remember the Old Testament command. Jesus quoted it, that we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. That, that's, that was a command in the Old Testament. Jesus quoted it again. That was something we were to do. We are to love our neighbor as ourselves. And that's not too hard to do when our neighbor is likable. But now we find in John 13, 34, that Jesus has elevated the command. Because not only are we to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, now Jesus says you're to love others as I have loved you, in the same way as I have loved you. This is a self-giving, sacrificial seeking the best for others kind of love. This is the kind of love that, as Jesus talked about, goes the extra mile. This is the kind of love that, that, that forgives multiple times. This is the kind of love that, well, it's love like Jesus loved. In John chapter 15, again, verses 12 and 13, uh, Jesus says this to us about love. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than he lay down his life for his friends. And over 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but in action and in truth. So what did Jesus do in relation to people when he was on this earth? How, how did he love? Well, we know that sometimes he met needs. He healed the sick. He fed the hungry. Sometimes Jesus showed great compassion 
to the lost, the hurting broken. But sometimes Jesus, if I can use the term, scolded those who were hypocritical. Jesus sometimes comforted. And Jesus sometimes convicted and condemned. Sometimes Jesus spoke harshly. Sometimes he spoke kindly. Because you see, what Jesus wanted what, what was what was best for everyone. He sought their highest good. And we have to understand that sometimes what is a person's highest good is not necessarily what they want. In other words, sometimes people are making choices that are not according to God's will and they may be in danger of eternal damnation. And if we love them, our responsibility is to try to reach out to them. Because you see, Jesus wants what's best for them. I heard a man give a testimony. Uh, he had been a drug addict for many, many years. Uh, he was now clean for some years. And he gave this testimony. He said, Jesus, when talking about when he was in his drug addiction, he said, Jesus loved me just as I was. But he loved me too much to let me stay as I was. Let me, let me, let me read that to you again. Here was his testimony. Jesus loved me just as I was, but he loved me too much to let me stay as I was. So what do we do when sometimes we're in those situations with people that uh, maybe are going the wrong path or people maybe we disagree with? I like the way Josh McDowell explained it. You may remember that name. Josh McDowell, an author, a speaker, apologist, said this. Tolerance says, you must approve of what I do. Love responds, I must do something harder. I will love you even when your behavior offends me. Tolerance says, you must agree with me. Love responds, I must do something even harder. I will tell you the truth because I'm convinced that the truth will set you free. Tolerance says, you must allow me to have my way. Love responds, I must do something harder. I will plead with you to follow the right way because I believe you are worth the risk. Tolerance seeks to be inoffensive. Love takes risks. Tolerance glorifies division. Love seeks unity. Tolerance costs nothing. Love costs everything. And so our responsibility as people who have been loved by God, who have received the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, are to love like he has loved us. And we learn to do that by spending more and more time with him, by spending time in his word and prayer, by asking his help, by letting the Holy Spirit begin to shape us, to allow God to do what he said he wanted to do, pour out his love in our hearts by the Holy Spirit he's given us, to begin to live out what it means to be a Christ follower, in those tough situations where we show people the love of God through the way we treat them. Which leads me to the fourth fact that I want to share with you. Our love is what draws others to Jesus. Our love is what draws others to Jesus. Now, I said at the beginning that it is God's love that drew us to Him. Well, now we have the responsibility as we pass that on because it is how we treat others that has the tremendous potential to bring others to him. Let me ask you, what, what is the identifying mark of the church, of any church? Uh, is, it, is it the music? Uh, is it the preaching? Uh, is it the doctrine? Uh, is it the program or programs? Now, now those things are important. Music, preaching, doctrine, programs are all very, very important. But that really does not necessarily distinguish the church. Uh, Jesus says in John chapter 13, verse 35, By this all men will know you are my disciples, if you love one another. Now I've seen this, and I understand it's true. You can have a church with a dynamic music program, powerful preaching, arrow straight doctrine, and fancy programs. And if they're arguing and fighting and complaining 
and forgiving, not forgiving one another. It's just a lot of noise. But if you get a church that does the best it can with the resources it has, but loves one another, works together, united for the glory of God, loves the community and reaches out to the community, that begins to draw people. Because people are looking for that kind of church. They're looking for that kind of love. They're looking for a place where they can attend, where people care for them. Love manifests itself in a variety of ways when we meet together. It manifests itself in, in how you greet one another. It manifests itself in how you try to meet others' needs. It manifests yourself in your willingness to give up your favorite seat because somebody new comes in. It manifests itself as you work together in the community to reach out, to let people know this is a grace place. This is a place where God's love is evident. No matter who you are, you're welcome here. It manifests itself in such a way that people sit up and take notice. There's something different about this place. This is not how the world treats each other. This is not how most people in the community treat each other. You folks are different. And it's when we do that, that that begins to draw people. Love makes the message attractive. My home church, where I was raised, my dad was an elder, mom was a Sunday school teacher, sang in the choir. First Christian Church of Haverty Grace, Maryland. That's where I'm from. Uh, my home preacher, when I was a teenager, uh, was not a very good public speaker. Just not good at all. But the church grew. And I look back on that and I realize that even though he was not a good public speaker, he loved us. And he loved the community. And we knew it. And we loved him. And that attracted people to that kind of love. And I believe, with all of my heart, that a church that's united, a church that works together to put away their differences and can agree together in so many things and be united under the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, that begins to attract people. They begin to see something that's different and they come to be a part of that kind of fellowship. I love this story. It was written by Terry Muck, M-U-C-K, in the March issue of Men of Integrity, March of 2009, he said this, A man who had no interest in spiritual matters lived next door to a Christian. They talked over the back fence, borrowed a lawnmower, stuff like that. Then the non-Christian's wife was stricken with cancer, and she died three months later. Here's part of the letter the non-Christian wrote after that. The non-Christian said, I was in total despair. I went through the funeral preparation and service like I was in a trance. After the service, I went to a path along the river and walked all night. But I didn't walk alone. My neighbor, afraid for, afraid for me, I guess, stayed with me all night. He didn't speak. He didn't even walk beside me. He just followed me. When the sun finally came up over the river... He came over and said, let's go get some breakfast. I, I go to church now. My neighbor's church. A religion that can produce that kind of caring and love that my neighbor showed me is something I want to find out more about. I want to love and be loved like that for the rest of my life. Even though apart, we are the family of God. Brought together by the love of God and the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, the greatest manifestation of love. Brought together to be a family where we love one another and care for one another and help one another. And not just our own little group, but any other Christ follower. And then into the community where we begin to love people in very practical ways, where we meet needs, where we care where we demonstrate the grace and the mercy and the kindness and the patience and the forgiveness that we've received ourselves to show to others. And folks, when you have that kind of love, that rules out such things as hatred and prejudice and bitterness and indifference and favoritism and refusing to forgive. You see, it brings about a family that even though apart, are in this together, 
in love. You really can't talk about love without reading the best description of love ever written. It's the great love chapter. I hope you know it. I want to close this message by reading that chapter to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Paul says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. My good Christian friends, even though apart, we are together in this, the body of Christ, God's children. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so very much for your gift of grace and for the work you did in providing for us the atonement, the sacrifice to pay our penalty through your son Jesus. And we thank you for the good news of the resurrection that Jesus now even is living to intercede for us and giving us the opportunity to know what it is to grow in the grace and the knowledge of he, the one who is our Lord and Savior. I pray for your church in this country, in this world, that we might demonstrate in the days to come your love in whatever situation we may face. And may you be honored and people drawn to you through that love and through the work of your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. God bless you. Would you sing with me? Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see, and all I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Summer and winter, springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, Morning by morning, new mercies.
these I see, and all I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. Thy own dear presence to cheer and to guide, strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies I see and all I have needed thy hand hath provided great is thy faithfulness Lord unto Would you pray with me now? God, we thank you so incredibly much for this wonderful meal we get to receive. That is the gift and the participation in in your death and resurrection. And um, we know that this gift of new life has been bestowed on us by you and you alone. May we live evermore in, in deep fellowship and communion with you, knowing that this is where the abundance of life truly resides. God, you are worthy to be praised at all times. We're so thankful for this meal. We receive it with glad hearts and in all humility. In your name we pray, amen. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul talks about this idea of a new covenant and what that means for us. So he compares it to Moses, how beforehand he would have to be veiled. He would have to cover himself to go before the Lord. But as Paul puts it, he said, But their minds were made dull. For the day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It's not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers our hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His image, with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So when we come to the Lord during this time of communion, our hearts are unveiled and we get to experience the full glory of the Lord together through this act of communion. And through this act of communion, we find freedom because we know that it means that there is forgiveness for our sins. So let's take together the bread, his body who is broken for us. Let's take together the cup of the blood that was shed for us. Let's go into this time of prayer with one another. Uh, First, let us begin by praying for church leaders um, across the, the nation and world as Um, They may be deciding to open up the building for services and for uh, just wisdom on knowing when the best time to do these things is and um, and for the health of those congregations and ours as well as we uh, start back next week. So let's let's come to our God and ask him for a special blessing in this way.
And now if we could, um, if we could just take a moment and pray for the, the families of, of Mick Clayton and, and Hope Harris that the matchless comfort and peace of our God would rest on them. Let's pray. Amen. It is good for us to pray together as the body of Christ. During the beginning of the service, we didn't sing the very last verse to praise to the Lord the Almighty, um, but I would like to sing it now as, as a benediction to the end of our time together uh, this day. And so, uh, would you sing with me uh, this very last verse? I think the lyrics are very fitting uh, for this place in our service. Praise to the Lord, oh let all that is in me adore Him. All that hath life and breath come now with praises before Him. Let the Amen sound from His people again, gladly for all we adore. Go in the peace of Christ, first Christian.